just want to lay some context on why these seven words from the cross weigh heavy on my heart. Uh, I was reading up some scientific and medical journals, and ex experts say uh, during crucifixion, there are many reasons a person can die. One of it is lack of breathing, not being able to breathe. You see, when a person is hoisted on a cross, like vertically, um, the shoulders dislocate, your upper body dislocates, and you're no longer able to use your diaphragm. Uh, so people end up having to use their feet to push their body up to breathe. And with those four to seven inch nail going right uh, through your feet, you can only keep that up for so long. Um, and it weighs on me knowing that Jesus, you know, struggling to breathe, experiencing all this pain, took time to say these words, words of love, words of grace, words for the church, words for you and me today. The first word says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Um, just going to walk us to three points. Um, first point is relationship. Second is um, reconciliation. And third is recognition. So the first word and the first point, relationship, taking, taking it from the first word, father. And if you're like me with like my chicken scratch theology, uh, I'm like, oh, I get God's sovereignty. And I'm like, Jesus, why are you saying father right now? Don't you get it? This father, he, he has everything in control, which means you being in this position of pain and suffering is the father's fault. Like, like just curse him and die, man. Like the thief, other thief on the cross said, like, you, you could be like, uh, uh, thinking like that, like, like God and his sovereignty has allowed this. You see, Jesus' relationship with the father wasn't dependent on his circumstance. Uh, he knew the father. He truly loved the father. And, and therefore, his circumstance did not define his relationship. His relationship with the father is eternal. Second word is, uh, second point, reconciliation, taken from the second word, forgive them. And uh, I can't help but wonder, right? Like one of the first times Jesus gets into this tussle with Pharisees is um, they, they kind of let this man who's, like a group of friends bring this man who's a paralytic, they drop him from the roof. Uh, Jesus ends up forgiving his sins. He doesn't heal the man first. He forgives his sins. And the Pharisees there are like, who's this person to forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus like, hey, just so that you guys know I have power, raises this man up. Um, and he, this man gets up, takes up his mat and walks. And I'm like wondering, like maybe there's a Pharisee there at Golgotha. Uh, as soon as he hears forgive them, he's like, Jesus, do you get it? This whole forgiveness business is what got you here. My friends, Jesus got it. Je Jesus got it. There, there was a price that had to be paid. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Says God's word. So Je Jesus got it. Um, the cross is a perfect and a beautiful image of God's forgiveness. A beautiful picture of God's love. That, that It's a beautiful image of the payment that it took for our sin. Last point today is recognition. Uh, Jesus says, forgive them for they, know, they do not know what they're doing. I'm like reading that like, Jesus, they knew exactly what they were doing. The, the, the soldiers, they knew they were slapping you, man. Like they, they, they were insulting you intentionally. Uh, the Pharisees, they wanted the murderer out. They intentionally asked for him to come out. And have you crucified? Like, they, they were in, like, some trance. Like, no, this is, like, intentional action. Uh, man, even your closest friend, Peter, your disciple Peter, he intentionally said he doesn't know you. My friends, Jesus, Jesus knows that. Jesus knows that. But he also knows that none of them recognized Jesus for who he truly was. The glory of God revealed in Christ. See, maybe, maybe, maybe you're like, maybe you're like the soldiers. Maybe you're sitting here. You, you don't, you don't care about Jesus. You don't recognize him for who he is. Maybe you, you don't care. You insult him. Use his name in vain. My friend, Jesus, Jesus recognizes you. He offers forgiveness. Maybe, maybe you're like Pilate. 
you, you, you kind of know Jesus is a good guy. You know he's innocent. But you're just swayed by what public opinion has to say about Jesus. My friend, Jesus recognizes you. He offers forgiveness. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're like the Pharisees. Maybe you're offended by Jesus and his teachings. My friend, Jesus recognizes you. He offers forgiveness. Maybe you're like Peter. Maybe you proclaim Christ. You, you, have, you call him Savior. You call him Messiah. But maybe he's not the Messiah that you thought he was. My friend, Jesus recognizes you. He offers forgiveness. Just want to conclude, uh, and as, as I'm concluding, I uh, just want us to consider these few things. Uh, do, do we recognize Jesus for who he truly is? And in that, do we recognize that we are sinners in need of a savior? Do we realize that there is true forgiveness in Christ? And if we, if we do, and if we have experienced that forgiveness and have surrendered our lives, do we realize that there is an eternal relationship with Lord? So, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. <clears throat> Immediately what sticks out to me is how thankful and, and blessed I am to be, to be with Christ, uh, to be in Christ. But in reading this, I also can't help but think of the inverse, you know, remembering what it was like to be without him. Um, I was just like the first thief, rebellious, entitled, self-righteous, unconcerned with my sin, a hardened heart darkened in my understanding, separate from Christ, alone, without hope, and without God in the world, unable to see the beauty of Christ, no hope beyond this life, only condemnation, but Christ opened my eyes and he Open this thieves' eyes as well. Um, what's interesting is that both thieves were in the same boat. Matthew 27, 44 says, And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. So what led this second thief to rebuke the other one, saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same condemnation? How did he go from being a reviler to being a worshiper? What did he see? Maybe he noticed that there was no desire or attempt to defend himself or prove his innocence. He probably noticed that when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He saw the perfect character of God in Christ. And I believe he saw just a glimpse of how beautiful the Savior is, and that was enough for him to see the error of his ways and throw himself upon the mercy of Almighty God. Even though Jesus was in the least likely place to convince anyone that he was the king of the universe, uh, the thief simply trusted his word was true. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he, was, what he promised. So... I think the first thing worth highlighting is how personal God is, how compassionate he was to extend his mercy to the thief while he was at his worst, physically suffering, dying on a cross. But on top of that, he was spiritually bankrupt, full of guilt and shame with no hope, no hope in himself or his final destination. But Christ looked upon his lowly estate and comforted him with his word. In his suffering, he spoke his beautiful promise to him. Today you will be with me in paradise. So not only did he give him this blessed hope of paradise in the future, which would only be a couple hours from then, but he gave him the word of life in the midst of his suffering. And so it is with us. Yes, we are driven by the eternal hope of paradise, but 
let's not forget how blessed we are that he allows us to get a glimpse of it, a taste, a taste of it now, to know that our sins are forgiven, that he is our shepherd and we belong to him, to experience communion with him in prayer, worship, and in his word, to see him bearing fruit in our lives and the lives of others, that we can rejoice in hope because we have something, or should I say someone, that cannot be taken from us. How... <laughs> How personal our God is that he cares for us. Where would, we, where would we be, where would I be without Christ and his word? So please don't neglect the word of God. Whoever lives to make intercession for his people. The word that says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. The word that says, and then we will forever be with the Lord. The word that says, in his presence is the fullness of joy. And the same word that says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human mind can conceive or comprehend what God has in store for those who love him. So I want to close with this. Um, the two thieves highlight the dual nature of what we're faced with, our situation. There's no gray area. There's no in-between. There's no middle ground. One man left justified and the other left condemned. Even though the thief was dying on the cross and only had a few hours left, Christ opened up a window of mercy to him. One took it and one did not. So don't be like the one who hardened his heart to this beautiful, merciful Savior. Don't be a reviler. Be a worshiper. Good evening. Uh, let me just pray before I begin. Lord, thank you um, for this time. Uh, it's so easy to um, forget the importance of this day when you see it all the time or when you think about it, to forget the weightiness of what you have done for us. Lord, I, help, I pray that you will help us focus in on you, that we will behold you and see you and what you have done as, as beautiful and, and, and is for us and is free. Lord, allow us to cling to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, so mine is John 19, 26 to verse 27, and it reads... When Jesus saw his mother and disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Referring to Jesus, Isaiah 52, 14 says, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured. He seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. So here's Jesus, bruised, beaten, and mocked. Though Jesus was suffering, he did not think of himself. He thought of others. First, he prays, Father, forgive them. Then he extends love to a repentant criminal. And now he cares for the grieving mother, all while suffering himself. Jesus cares for his mother by placing her in the care of the love of the disciple. But Jesus doesn't say to the disciple, take care of my mother. Or to his mother, this is my brother. But says, behold your son. And to the disciple, behold, your mother. Jesus takes two people who are not biolog <clears throat> biologically related, but make them mother and son. He also doesn't leave Mary in the care of one of his earthly brothers, which shows that our relationship are much more deeper with a spiritual family than our earthly. For we see this in scripture, 
Matthew 12, verse 46 through 50. As Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside asking to speak to him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brother are standing outside and they want to speak to you and they want to speak to you. Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who are my brother? And then he pointed to the disciples and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, sister, and mother. What Christ has done with his mother and loved, and loved disciple is what he has done with the church. For he has, brought us, he has bought us and brought us together. No matter our ethnic, ethnicity, <clears throat> political affiliation, circumcised or uncircumcised, rich or poor, we all belong to him when we put our faith and trust in him. Galatians 3, 26, verses through 29 says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism put on Christ. Like in put on new clothes. There is no longer Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heir, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. When Christ died, he didn't just save us to be alone. He gave us a body to be a part of. Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. And in it, mother finds son, son finds mother, brother finds sister, sister finds brother. All because of the redemptive work and unifying work of Christ. How are you serving Christ through your local body? Are you given 100% as Christ? Or are we, or, or only where it's convenient? In the words of our brother Han, church, behold your brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, behold your church family. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. About three. Ili, Ili, Lama, Savakdani! My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46 is our focus. It parallels uh, Mark 15, 34. Uh, slightly different language. There's some transliteration. Uh, all kinds of theologian discussions around why they use different transliterations, but that's not our focus. What is our focus? Why did Jesus say this? Did he truly feel forsaken? Did God the Father turn away from God the Son because he took on our sin and experienced the wrath of God? He knew it was coming and he accepted it. Jesus was God in the flesh, John 1, 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, Philippians 2, 6 through 7. Although being in very nature, God was made in human likeness, Luke 22, 42 through 44. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling upon the ground. First John 2.2, 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also the sins of the whole world. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So, did God the Son feel forsaken? Perhaps, but again, that's not our focus. Our focus is in two areas, the prophecy and the promise. The context, the followers of Jesus knew the scripture. They memorized the scripture. At that point in time, you couldn't go to a Lifeway and buy a Bible, and the Gideons didn't exist, so they memorized everything. 
So as soon as he quoted one piece of scripture, they knew the entire passage. Shouting 22 Psalm, shouting Psalm 22 1 would bring to mind all of Psalm 22 in the thoughts of Jesus' followers. They would see the fulfillment of the words penned hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, being experienced by Jesus in the flesh on the cross. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. You are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust at my mother's breast. Oh, you, on you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb have been my God. Be not far from me, for the trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many pull, bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted with my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the jaws. You lay in me the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when cried out to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear them. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to my Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. So that one phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They heard all of those words. They saw Jesus experiencing that prophecy. And as they saw the prophecy coming true, they knew that that meant the promise was going to come true. Notice that the one who suffered and called out to God at the beginning of Psalm 22 would be redeemed at the end. But even before he was redeemed, he knew that he was not forsaken. In verse 21, save me from the lion's mouth, yea, from the horns of the wild oxen, thou hast answered me. So he knew even before he was redeemed that he was going to be redeemed. Jesus reminded his followers then and even now as we hear these words, as we read these words, that while it may be, it appear as if God the Father had forsaken the Son, that wasn't the end of the story. And when we feel forsaken, it's not the end of the story. It's Friday, Good Friday. Why? Because Sunday is coming. Today we're talking about the cross, but Sunday brings the kingdom. Good evening, everyone. Do you mind if I pray before I start here? Thank you. 
Thank you, Jesus, for Good Friday. Thank you for your utter suffering and sacrifice for our ultimate joy. In Jesus' name, amen. My saying is, I thirst. It comes from John 19, 28, and 29. And it reads, after this, Jesus, knowing all that would, would be finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Amen. Jesus, my friends, was thirsty. How so? Remember, he had prayed late in the garden. He had been arrested in the night. He was marched before the high priest, questioned, abused, slapped, and then paraded to Pilate back and forth in Herod, questioned more, abused more, flogged, crowned with thorns, made to carry the heavy cross in the heat of the dry day, and nailed ultimately to the cross. Which man would not be thirsty at this point? But was this not Jesus, who had not long before had told the Samaritan woman that if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says, that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus told her that everyone who drinks of this well water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water I give them will never thirst. And the water will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 4, 10 through 14. Now, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 41 and 17 declares, when the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. This is God talk. He is God. But now he hangs on the cross saying, I thirst. The Pharisees standing by, mocking him, stating, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. But John tells us that Jesus allowed this to fulfill the scripture, as in Psalm 69 and 21 states, they gave me poison for food, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. As in 1 Peter 2 and 24, he himself bore our sin in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. He was not thirsting for righteousness. He is righteousness. So he took it, he took it like a man, not just any man, but the pure man, the complete man, the perfect man that he is, fulfilling the scripture in every detail. And so, you know by this, that he is very God and he's very man. God in the flesh, who had been foretold. 
and is the Savior of the world. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just humble our hearts before you. God, our souls are truly overwhelmed by what you've done at the cross and just hearing these brothers even speak and remind us, Lord, it is your compassion, your mercy to even to show us these beautiful words. Father, I pray that Lord, would you expound the words of Christ and Lord, would the Christ of the word be exalted. Give us understanding, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. John 19, 30 says, It is finished. Come now to one of the most weighty and wondrous sayings of Jesus on the cross. Three words in English. It is finished. One word in the original Greek. To tell us die. So you would hear this expression from maybe an artist that's, that's wrapping up that masterpiece or from a woodworker putting those finishing touches, or even from someone fixing up an old Detroit house to tell us die. Maybe not so much on the last one. <laughs> to be more precise, the original words here was, were used with the context of commercial transactions. So think of a, a contract that has been fully executed or a payment that has been made to tell us die. So we find these words, as Brother Joe read in John chapter 19. I'm going to pick it up in 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, and we jump down to verse 30, he said, it is finished. He said these three words, with much more power and authority than that of any artist, a woodworker, Detroit remodeler. Charles Spurgeon actually gives us a little bit more context here. It was a conqueror's cry. It was uttered with a loud voice. There's nothing of anguish about it. There's no wailing in it. It is the cry of one who has completed a tremendous labor. So in the few minutes together, I want to focus our attention on what is the it that Jesus finished, and what does it mean for us, Restore Church? So first, the it, and really the it of Good Friday. Tony Evans summarizes this passage. The issue of the cross is more than a great example of sacrifice. It's more than simply a statement of what a great leader would do for his cause. It has to do with debt incurred by sin. And this sin is a debt that the human race is unable to pay. The it of Good Friday starts with our sin before a holy and just God. God doesn't grade on a curve and say you tried or you're close enough. Have you tried paying your bills by being close enough or paying most of your taxes? We owed a debt to God we could not pay, but Jesus paid it all on the cross and in full to tell us die. My sin debt, your sin debt, has been fully paid on the cross. Paul says it perfectly in Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demand. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Amen? Amen. So what does to tell us time mean for us on this Good Friday? Two application points and one encouragement. We don't have to pretend. Our tendency is to pretend that we're not as bad as we truly are. And our sin is not deserving of judgment. It's not just blind spots, but blinders to what? The Holy Spirit reveals and what scripture reveals about sin. A quick example, the last time anger showed up in our lives, right, with our family members especially, right, with, with our loved one, our spouse, our kids. All we have to do is look a little bit deeper and it's usually triggered by an idol, idol of maybe 
approval, control, pleasure, success, security, recognition, respect, just to name a few. And when we're scared to bring our sin and these idols to the light, we have forgotten that sin has already been fully paid. Application number two, we don't have to perform. Our tendency is to treat God's grace as the starter kit, and the rest is a DIY project to reach God on our own. Let's call it what it is. That's self-righteousness or works righteousness. And this shows up, again, in very subtle ways, even with our families, because we do the right thing with our spouse or our kids, we're godly, or with our theology, we, or we're compassionate, we're hardworking in our jobs, or maybe you're, you're good with your finances, have good politics. But when we perform, we forget that the contract of righteousness has already been fully executed by Jesus. There's nothing more we need to add to it. So let me finish with this. Jesus speaks a final word over my sin and your sin if you have placed your faith in Jesus. If you're battling the guilt and shame of pretending, repent and put your faith in Jesus and his finished work. If you're battling false righteousness, repent and put your faith in Jesus and his finished work. Psalm 103 declares this beautiful truth over the it is finished phrase. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions. Be encouraged on this Good Friday. Okay, let's open up our Bibles to Luke 23, starting at chapter 44. It might be on the screen, might not. But. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. <clears throat> Let's pray. Good and gracious Father in heaven, we just come before you now, Lord. We ask that the Holy Spirit be in and among this place, Lord, giving intercession and Correcting my words and giving um, ears to hear that um, which is only of your word. And um, yeah, we pray that these words can be stirred up and understood and planted in our hearts like they um, never have, Lord, that um, we may in this time just glorify you, Lord. We pray that this time is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Um, as we have arrived at our last of Jesus' seven sayings on the cross, I quickly want to remind us of, of where we are, um, just for context sake. And I want to note here that in order to identify, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, um, as the last thing Jesus said uh, before he died, it requires that we kind of cross-reference the other Gospels. So if you had only read John's Gospel account, it might appear that um, it is finished what Tom had covered in John 19 after Jesus receives the sour wine um, would be the last thing that he had said before he died. Mark's gospel would imply that his final words were a, quote, loud cry shortly after the ninth hour, which would have been 3 p.m., after Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew's gospel, which is really similar to Mark's, it includes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there's a debate that follows among the spectators that, he was calling Elijah, and Jesus, quote, cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit, and intense earthquakes followed, and the curtain of the temple ripped right in half. So we can assume that this loud cry that is noted in Mark and Matthew's accounts, and Jesus is yielding up his spirit here, um, is what Luke rec recorded when Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
So that ought to just give you an idea of where we're at here. The final three sequences we have here based on Jesus' preceding sayings are first, God's wrath coming upon Jesus by way of separation from the Father for taking our sin, which prompted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's number one. Then two, the wages of all sin, past, present, and future, being paid in full, a debt which we contributed to, which was represented by what Tom covered, and it is finished. And the very last, the third thing, which we're, we're at now in, in Luke 44, Jesus, in full confidence in death, in submission to the Father's will and his plan, preparing for his spirit to be reunited to the Father, saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. What's incredibly cool here is that in this saying, Jesus is also quoting Psalm 31, verse 5, and Leo um, covered this a little bit as well. This was written by David, Psalm 31, and Psalm 31 reads, In your righteousness deliver me, incline your ear to me, Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. And it goes on to say, for you are my refuge. And here it is. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. And this is David. And he's praying desperately in a time. He's praying desperately for redemption, rather. And he's praying to be rescued by the Lord. And hundreds of years later, the seed of David, God in the flesh, and Jesus on the cross, in his last words, confirms that David, and you, and I, and every other sinner in need of saving are indeed saved by Jesus' death. How? Christ took our sin, and he paid for it, with his brutal and unjust death, and now... He's our only way to the Father. Without Christ, we could never say in death, on our deathbeds or, or wherever you might be at the time you're dying, we could never say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, because we would be separated from God because of our sin. And God can't be in the presence of sin. He's perfect. He's holy. Note that Jesus doesn't say here, Father, please allow me to come into your presence once I die. No. Sin was paid immediately by his sacrificial death, and Jesus in victory knew that. The curtain of the temple ripping in half that Matthew, Mark, and Luke include, represents, which represented man's separation from God, is our confirmation of this. So, just a final recap here. Jesus, who was separated from God for taking on our sin, now in his final words saying, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit, he knows that his death reunites his spirit to the Father. And for us, for you and me and David and, and everybody, simply by faith through Christ and what he did there on the cross, and by repentance, turning from our sin as well, this reconciliation to the Father is offered to us as a gift of God's grace. So we don't have to go to hell when we die. We don't have to be separated from God forever in eternal death because Christ has already died in our place. 